Um, we've had a lot of excess of this and uh, maybe some negative of this over the week. I'll come back to the reasons why I'm putting those on the table. <laughs> yeah. So um, the advantage with not having a theory and not having any, uh, can everyone hear? Uh, not having um, any patents to defend or anything like this and being a member of a group who uh, are a, a group of individuals who can free think and challenge each other um, is that we can go out and challenge other people's research and uh, we never set out to be a group that ends up being called Lena Busters but we seem to be going in that direction but anyway. <laughs> um, so I ask myself, you know, there's so many theories out there, um, is, is there some way that we can use something that's very well defined in order to uh, separate, you know, one theory from other and, and, and try and establish some fact uh, in this space. So I ask the question, can rare isotopes establish Lena theory? Oh, this is for Jeunesse. <laughs> this is the order of electrical engineers, so uh, you have the Maltese cross there the symbol of God-given power, and out of darkness cometh light. I went to a museum in the UK and with my daughter and I saw this. I thought that was quite interesting uh, re relative to your talk the other day. It's not maths after this, by the way. You'll be pleased. <laughs> so uh, our great uh, researcher, Alan Goldwater, uh, produced this thing called the glow stick. And over a series of experiments exploring uh, Rossi's claims and his patent formula, uh, nickel, lithium, and lithium aluminium hydride, uh, we had two significant experiments. One which we called uh, Signal, um, which we thought at the time may be due to some sort of brown from something going on in the reactor. Uh, we had dead time in our scintillator, uh, quite significant, and some downtime in the power monitor. And whether these were correlated, we, we don't exactly know because it, it was in a fairly large time slice, but maybe. So then we thought there's a bit of radiation. We can detect something outside. So should we um, have more radiation monitoring? Everyone says, no, there's not this and there's not that. But if we don't put anything there, we can't say for definite whether there wasn't anything. So we decided to buy some bubble detectors because we couldn't afford decent neutron detection. And this is actually very good neutron detection. So we had a, a fast and th a thermal neutron bubble detector. and. We saw a few bubbles in the thermal, but nothing in the um, uh, uh, fast neutron detection. Around about, it's actually 304 degrees, I think, from the live data. So that got us all very excited, especially since I was calling someone in and I was actually looking at the bubble detector and one appeared in front of my eyes and I only was like 12 inches away from the reactor. I thought I probably should move away. Um, Anyway, so I thought, well, how can we use something that's incredibly well understood? So this is positron emission tomography. Hopefully none of you studying nuclear physics will need a PET scan to uh, we'll see whether you've got cancer at some point. But it's probably the, one of the most studied transmutations in history. Um, fantastic amount of data out there. And the really cool thing about this, it has you know, this uh, very well-defined 18 oxygen PN reaction to 18 fluorine, which decays at around about 110 minute half-life back uh, to uh, 18 oxygen. So it recycles itself uh, with a positron at 633 that annihilates uh, whatever, and you get two five, uh, 611 kV or 511 kV uh, photons, which you can arrange your scintillators to uh, uh, detect. Um, and you can see, oh, can I do a laser? Where's the laser? How do you do the laser? This one, okay. Um, there's a kind of, you don't really get much above, uh, below four MeV on, on the, the incoming proton, but at about uh, 5.1 there's a sweet spot and around about uh, six something there's a sweet spot. And so, uh, you know, I thought we might be able to use that. Uh, and also, you know, if there are some, thermal neutrons going around, maybe we can get this reaction which is very different. You, you've got a beta at 4.8 MeV, might cause Brum's driving. Uh, so the glow stick 5.4 uh, was to test 
uh, Pien, Telly, and Sarg theories, and possibly Goddard's theory by way of uh, the IT and oxygen tracer. Um, Piantelli claims 0 to 6.7 MeV by taking, calculating it, he says, and also taking it out of a reactor in a period of time afterwards, showing in a cloud chamber that, that there is an energy, I think it's 8 centimeters or something, uh, any way he calculates it. And so we wanted to see whether we could see this signal. Um, uh, and then also, uh, uh, the neutron might uh, convert some 19 oxygen, so seeing these two together might tell us something. Um, if you had ultra slow neutrons form, could it do two? I don't know. There's people in the room that could give me a better answer on that. I don't know. And then absence of thermal neutrons detectable by the bubble detectors would lend support to Sarg theory because he says that the structure of the seven lithium is, is a helium atom and a tritium atom and it gets a, a, attached to the nickel and then the Rydberg state hydrogen comes along and it knocks off a neutron. Um, but so 5.4 didn't have any lithium in it. Uh, it was just uh, some 62 nickel, which was stupidly expensive, uh, to try and increase the reaction rate. Um, uh, some uh, uh, very fine nickel, some processed nickel um, that Alan processed for a long period of time. Um, and so this AL2-1803, uh, which we got from Russia, and it was about 99 or 95 percent pure. And why I like this is because we already had a AL203 in the reactor. So we weren't any adding anything to the system that we didn't already have, um, other than the isotopes. And we've got some videos showing all the equipment here. And we developed a whole range of equipment. Uh, Alan did this six lithium detector, very affordable. Uh, he built that. We also noticed that the tube that we had, the, the, the sort of cheap off the shelf Geiger counter, was not sensitive at all to this type of radiation. Um, uh, we looked at muon detection here because of Homlid's work. Maybe there's muons coming out. Um, we found that you could use a webcam with some software developed by a Russian. And one of our followers also developed this uh, cosmic ray app. And you basically tape over. We put it in one centimeter of lead. And you get spots or squiggles. And they're basically beta particles. But a straight line across the CCD um, is, according to a guy that when I wrote to him, uh, sent me lots of papers back about how cold fusion was nonsense and I shouldn't waste my life, <laughs> who invented this technique. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we went ahead with that and, and we calibrated it with all sorts of sources. And these neutron detectors that are very dark down here with three helium, and that was developed by Bob, Bob Higgins. And this is open source. I think Alan's shared the, the circuits on that. Uh, what was the results? We saw no 5 kV photons. <laughs> we saw no Bramstrahling. But there were no thermal neutrons, which doesn't say anything really, does it? Except that this is positive for um, uh, Sarg theory. Um, now, 5.5 .5 to test uh, Sarg theory, Homlid theory, and. Uh, uh, hmm? Oh, sorry, I'm moving in and out, am I? Okay. Um, was, uh, uh, we were adding nano lithium, lithium aluminium deuteride, and uh, the dehydrogenation catalyst. Uh, so, again, we're testing various theories here. I'll skip over this because you'll have it in the slides and the actual result was this, uh, which is the planned thing to go in, but we're pending execution on that. So the real meat is in this second experiment in combination with the first and it should help us separate all the different experiments. There's a lot to say so I'm going to move on from that. So. We hope this is something you can do. The, the aluminium 18 oxygen is relatively affordable. You can throw it into your experiments. If you're running more experiments than we can, we're able to do, why not give it a try? Um, I was given some ash from the KV3 reactor uh, from Alexander Parkamov and uh, Nicholas Chauvin uh, assisted financially to pay for this. Um, and uh, this is, we used MALDI, TOF MS matrix assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry. And uh, it's, you know, you have a, a matrix, but we didn't in our case because we were just firing the laser at the source. Uh, the reactor ran uh, between December the 12th, 2016 and, and January 31st, 2017. 1.8 grams of nickel and H2. It's a P and Telly only. 1,700 degrees. 
uh, was the heater temperature here, 400 megajoules compared to again to a calibrate just a without the fuel in it version, but with hydrogen as I understand it. And we've already tested it with at least three different independent parties the powder that was used for the nickel, um, so we know what's in there. Uh, this was a sample of the uh, ash that he gave us, and we put it in this. Uh, Axima, um, it, I can't remember the name, I've got it, a link somewhere here. Um, but here, it's basically got, got like a CD tray here, and we put it on the sample tray like this, and we put it in, and then it went onto the floor. Because <laughs> it's only got a clearance of like one millimeter. We go, oh, we're going to have to make that a bit flatter. Um, so uh, Alan did this. We went out and bought a hammer. <laughs> I can see everyone cringing in the room. Uh, and this, and we flattened it, and it was surprisingly ductile. It just flattened right out. Um, so anyway, you take literally stack loads of samples in here and uh, it integrates those and we ended up with this signal. I'm going to cut this short, Alan, sorry. Um, basically, we saw this very large signal here at uh, 137.9 and of course, what we, we're not seeing below 90 because these are mostly dimers and up here it's like some sort of molecule. Um, because of the way the system works. We thought, what is this? And uh, we thought, is it Lady Gaga? <laughs> we thought, yeah, I'm a bit naive, so I thought we'd try this first. And uh, you have three isotope, uh, two isotopes, and you get this combination, two factorial. Um, and it looked like we got a single isotope here. And, and the, the, the operator said, yeah, we're a little bit off on our uh, thing here. So where's these isotopes? This is, what, what, I think I've seen this somewhere before. We got all very excited because I did these calculations about two years ago on P and Telly theory, and if you run the reaction chains for just the nickel hydrogen system, you end up down here with 69 gallium, uh, and two of those equals that mass. We got very excited, and then I went, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Six sodium, oh, well, there we go. And uh, it's bang on the money, look at that. Oh, that's depressing, isn't it? So we thought, let's see if it is sodium. We'll try and get rid of it and uh, whatever else it might be from our hammering on new tools. So we, we did an HCL, um, deionized water and, and propanol wash. And you can see that the counts went from something like 5,000 down to 2,500 here. All of the data is accessible here. Uh, and the sodium was an even better fit. I mean, it's still offset here for the Gaga. Um, yeah, so. We didn't find anything there. But, hold on a minute, we started with nickel and hydrogen. We've got a shed load of sodium. It's like the way biggest count. Okay, that's interesting. So, uh, I'm going to move on to Suhas Ralkar. Um, and this is a guy, I gave a presentation with a nuclear scientist in the room, we were bowing their heads in shame. But uh, Suhas thought it was bang on the money and decided to reveal this technology to me. Whether it's real, we'll hopefully be able to tell in the next couple of weeks. Um, but essentially, it's instant on off, ultrasonically fluidized uh, dusty plasma, new fire reactor. Whew, dear. What a mouthful. You've got an ultrasonic here, here around about one megahertz. Uh, you have fuel here. These are processed. He produces these foils that stops uh, the, the, the powder from migrating. And it also um, uh, provides a breathable membrane. It makes the construction of the unit. And there's eight units in a particular cell. Um, and then he has one of these electrodes pointing about two, two millimeters through. It's a thoriated tungsten rod. And uh, the ultrasonics is driven at the same as the DC pulse. It's not a spark. It explodes if you have a spark. It's a, it's a glow discharge in here. Uh, here's the fuel in his current combination. But he says uh, the titanium, titanium, hydride, nickel, and carbon gives you all your real reaction with a bit of al aluminium. He says the potassium and the lithium didn't really add anything. Um, uh, aluminum oxide, uh, uh, the ultrasonic vibration is 15 to 35 watts, depending on the coupling and how efficiently that's going, and 100 watts on the non-spark discharge at 2,000 to 2,400 volts, and he claims this kind of input-output. Uh, he processes his foil like this. There's a, a, a 50 mil uh, 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 sort of bar, which is 2 mil deep, and he passes this in and out. This is a, a plastic 
pump and the plastic tubes and he's putting nickel sulfate that's in de deionized water through here. He has uh, uh, 200 volts and it's uh, 300 uh, kilohertz and on the bar he's also got the same 300 kilohertz sending surface waves down with the direct contact at one end and he cycles this in and out and you end up with this foil uh, that is animated so here's a little bit more detail you can get from the slides uh, about how it works. And we found this on the foil, just randomly. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. So it was interesting because actually it was it was this that was more interesting because uh, the the woman at the Maverick University, you know, first thing she looked at and she goes, "Oh, I, I've done something wrong with my equipment. Sorry, just bear with me." Um, uh, no, that's all right. Um, why have you got gold and palladium on your <laughs> nickel foil? I said, I don't know, but I might have an idea. Uh, and, you know, the size of these things, you can see it's about 10 microns uh, long and a few microns wide. The silver feature is almost essentially entirely pure silver. Um, it's about, again, 5 microns in, in uh, cross section and, and about 10 microns long. Uh, so we're getting some precious metals, so this palladium gold um, by weight, you've got, what, where is it, 21% there. I'm thinking, has this been seen before? Um, well, it has with Adam Enko. Uh, so he's got a copper uh, electrode, cathode, and, and anode, and the anode get, explodes with whatever it is, and uh, you get like mm, gold 76% over here, and so on. Uh, so it's been seen before, and also Miley, in specifically nickel and H2O. Uh, you see the gold here. On the back side of the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, nickel foil, which he delaminates by using ultrasonics to send a surface wave and remove it so he can use it in his reactor, you see lead, and it's only on the back side, which is quite interesting. Um, you see the silver here, uh, and some of the other elements that we're, we're seeing. Um, are on these peaks that Miley saw. So uh, this is the second part of the processing. You need the fuel. So he has these one and a half kilowatt horns uh, here, uh, driven at uh, 19.46 kilohertz. And he puts the fuel in here, which is uh, um, at least titanium, uh, nickel, uh, which he sometimes does a pre-pass with uh, tungsten to smash it up, and then he, he centrifuges, sieves that, and then he puts in carbon, and in total it processes for 200 hours. He found through many tests that he didn't see any excess heat if he processed less than 160 hours. And so then I went and looked at the isotopes in this. Fuel. I mean, when I went to him, I just sat in, sitting at his desk. It was a totally impromptu meeting. And I said, have you got anything I can look at? He says, uh, look, he said, what, like samples? Or, yeah, I said, uh, yeah, like ash or whatever. And he goes, uh, there's some foil there. You can have that. And I think this is some part processed fuel. <laughs> so it was completely off the cuff. There was no prearrangement or anything. And this is what I saw. And it's like big flat plates. What's that all about? What's going on there? So we looked at this, and what we've got is a very large amount of lead. What? I mean, it looks like lead, doesn't it? It looks like bits of lead you've squished. But it's huge amounts of lead, and most of it's lead. And then a lot of it's niobium and zirconium, and also tin you've got in there. Niobium and tin? Yeah, look, look at this. Niobium, tin, uh, you also got the titanium from where it started, zirconium. So uh, what, what's, what's going on here? Is this contamination or is something else going on? Well, I'm going to go back to the contamination idea because uh, what we've got here is piezo transducers. And they might be made of lead, zirconium, titanium, tin, maybe, I don't know. But uh, I've questioned him. He says these are all sprayed. I mean, they've got to jump from here into the sealed vessel because he has a cap on here and, uh, and everything and basically replace the material in there. It's, it's, it's serious contamination, uh, short of smashing this up and putting it in there. Uh, and he assures me that's not happened. Um, uh, so what is it? Well, they seem to be everything you need to make superconductors, like niobium, niobium and tin. You, niobium is like the highest critical temperature. 
Um, and also, you know, could you have these excited states? I mean, what you've got going on in there is cavitation in the extreme, 200 hours of four and a half kilowatts smashing that stuff up. Um, now, I have another hypothesis, and I, I call it sort of uh, the evangelical thing. Like, the, the nucleons are all a bit messed up, and it's like going to an evangelical church, and they're all waving their hands around, and you're the guy sat down, and you're going, uh, I feel a little uncomfortable here. So you get up, and you start waving your hands around, and, and it's just the easiest thing to do is become the kind of signal that you're being sent. I mean, this is just a random idea, okay? Um, and that's what I'm privileged to do in my position. Um, so, uh, yeah, so superconductors. The next part of my talk, which is nearly over, uh, is uh, it needs a prerequisite. You haven't watched my uh, uh, Copenhagen lecture, but I essentially ha uh, showed how to access the, the energy from the, uh, from the vacuum using Stoy and Sarg's uh, detailed account of how to do that. Um, uh, charge clusters and their stability and properties from Stoy and Sarg, the work of Eagley, and uh, from uh, Kenneth Shoulders. Uh, how. Ooh, how um, RF and microwave can initiate special states of matter to deliver linear effects and up and down energy sampling is all in that previous presentation. Um, anyway, in that presentation, I asked these questions. What connects Kenneth Shoulders, John Hutchinson, Alz, and this guy? And in fact, I answered these bits, but I said, I'm going to leave this for another day. David, David Hudson and monoatomic elements. Well, it's uh, Harold Putoff. Every time we had success in our project, this chap would uh, send his organization to offer us some assistance. Whether there would be a scintillator when we saw the gamma in Chilani's experiment, or when it looked like we were able to do uh, uh, the Vladimir Vysotsky and Alakorn Lenova's replication. Yeah, we can help with that. We can help with that. We can help with that. But I didn't know this guy set it up. Uh, but I did discover when Kenneth Shoulders had died and I wanted to meet him that he worked for a very long time with this chap. And then I knew that Kenneth Shoulders uh, worked with John Hutchinson, and I know that Dr. Harold Puthoff also wrote an appeal to work with John Hutchinson, and that these two were the people that respected each other mutually. So this was interesting, and so I thought I'd look into David Hudson. I'll just read you something. Like, this is rubbish. But he's giving like one of the last speeches before he died, and it's kind of like an informal meeting. So you know, I make mistakes. I guess he can too. Uh, when I began to uh, do the literature studies, I found out that in the macro metal, the temperature of the atoms is actually being measured now over in Europe and blah, blah, blah. This is rubbish, 350 degrees. But he says, as you disaggregate the clusters in the metal down to smaller and smaller, uh, the temperature of the atom goes down and down. A three atom cluster is about 23 degrees Kelvin, a two atom cluster is about 12, and a one atom, one atom well, they don't know what that is, but they say it's about two to three degrees Kelvin. I won't go into that. You probably all say it's rubbish. I don't know. Uh, that's what he says. Um, and niobium, lead, and tin all meet the condition to be a superconductor as formed in his uh, reactor when they are monoatomics. And I would, knowing what I did with that moldy thing, you shoot a, a laser at, at something or a highly excited energy, you get these dimers coming off, or you get these single uh, uh, element ions coming off. So are we generating everything we need, putting it in the reactor, then creating a whole bucket full of semiconductors? And then I, I couldn't make this up, literally, in the same speech that he gave. He says, now this sounds pretty preposterous, except if he's a perfect superconductor. He can levitate, he can walk on water. And tomorrow I will share with you some of the papers by Harold Putoff down in Austin, Texas, who worked on the government contracts on psychic telepathy, mental uh, connections between people, and he's now been working with levitation, time travel, and all that. He's published some papers developing Sarkov's theory about gravity. The gravity is, in fact, an interaction of matter, the protons, and the neutrons, and the electrons with a zero-point vacuum energy, and this matches what's going on here. What we experience in gravity is, in fact, the interaction of matter with the zero-point energy. This is what Sarg says. Uh, that there is no gravitational field per se, and in his calculations and the mathematics, he calculates that when matter is a resonance connected in two dimensions, it no longer interacts in three dimensions, but it has an interacting two dimensions. And he says, by what he calls the jitterbug motion, which loses four-ninths of its gravitational weight, and whoever it was that presented last, that's the opposite of what they have on their chart. <laughs> I don't know whether it's relevant. Um, 
um, or it weighs 56 percent, which if you recall is exactly what our monoatomic elements weigh, 56 percent, five ninths of the true weight, which means that the material is a resonant connected quantum oscillator resonant in two dimensions, which just happens to be the definition of a superconductor. And so Hal Puthoff said to him when they met him, Dave, you know what this means. It means that when you can control space time, if you can control gravity, and you can control gravity, you are controlling space time. And so literally what these atoms are doing, they're bending space time to weigh five ninths. There are theories in the published blah, blah, blah. You can read it when you get the slides. I'm nearly done, yeah. So I'd like to thank all of these people. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank Matthew for his contribution. Uh, Matthew told me at ICCF 20 that he would have to uh, move into the commercial realm. But he says he'll still help out with the project and that's great, but he's contributed hugely to our uh, formal work. So a special thank you to Matthew. If there are any questions, I'll take them now. It's not my information. What do you know about the regime of the solar and the microwave? Why? The principle of one mega yes is used in these experiments. What changed the experimental results when they changed the frequency of the Okay. okay, so what you missed in the process of producing this fuel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. you've got an ultrasonic horn. Yes, and it's, it's specifically chosen. So he chooses the size of particles or something, two, two to five microns. And he actually puts it through a, a pyrolyzing process where he acetone washes it and then he puts it through a, a, a sieve uh, and he throws away 80% of his 200 hour process material so he has the resonant particles. And what he's looking for is a, a, P, a surface wave to go around the particle and, 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 and waves to tr propagate through the particle. So the actual particle shape when it touches the side it gets some stimulus that's resonant with it. It's shaking, it's shaking around it and it's going through this uh, uh, glow discharge, which is pulsed. That's what he does. Yeah. I have some thoughts. Yeah. I have some thoughts for you. The, um, you, you mass spectroscopy, low resolution, relatively low resolution mass spectroscopy is, is uh, very difficult to make sense out of it. You can back that up with some extra fluorescence to do elemental identification. It's and next on our list. We, we had it booked, but I, I couldn't do it before. And, we... and for your uh, XRF, um, the low energy extra, XRF uh, spectra, if you don't really know what you're looking for, sometimes a, a real headache uh, to sort out. Um, if you're going to make a claim for silver, um, you know, for Emma's sake, do it with a K shell uh, extra fluorescence. That's, that's uh, far more unambiguous. Mm. Um, you know, again, same thing. For if you've got even higher Z things, go for uh, at least L shell. It's harder to get a K shell. But it's it's worth the effort if you get a K shell. That's sort of much more uh, much closer to being unambiguous. He, he sent me fresh foil, and if there are people interested in doing analysis of part, part samples, I'd be happy to send them to people that have more expertise than the labs that I was using. Mm. Why he used Torian Tungsten? He has a lot of special characteristics. Uh, well, I, I think it's uh, partly for initiation because of the, the low work function of the, the, the thorium uh, to start the uh, glow discharge. I, I think that's, and also it comes with a point. You can buy it off the shelf. You can point it, push it through the, the thing. It's got everything you need. And, and so it, the design came from what it is and made the design, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's a welding rod. Yeah. So by way of an epilogue, I want to clear up some points uh, since the presentation and also to add a little bit of detail and talk about an Easter egg that was planted in the presentation for the people at ASTI, but no one picked up on it.
So the first thing was the analysis of the Parkamov KV3 reactor. And in the presentation, I said at that time, I was uncertain whether it was six sodium atoms, uh, the na-na-na-na-na-na, that one, or the Lady Gaga, the two gallium atoms uh, together. Uh, now, gallium will preferentially form a dimer, um, which is interesting in of itself. Uh, it also has a lot of interesting properties, uh, being able to melt in the palm of your hand and uh, be dissolved into metal. Perhaps that explained why it was so ductile, the sample that we were uh, analysing. And it also has the highest uh, differential between the melting point and the boiling point. So, very interesting metal. Now, what you're looking at here is the single isotope dimer of two gallium atoms on the right and the six sodium atom cluster on the left. And you'll see that the sodium atom cluster is slightly to the right of the peak. So it's not on the peak, it's slightly to the right. The gallium dimer is slightly to the left. And actually, if you look at the data, for all of the peaks in the data set, which there is a link in the presentation, you will find that they are off to the left. And actually at the time, the guy doing the analysis said there was a little offset. So actually, it does appear that it was a dimer of Gaga, um, uh, gallium, and this does support Piantelli theory and also uh, the observance of uh, gallium in the Lugano reactor. So I will leave it at that. And the next point I want to make is about a little Easter egg that was in the presentation that no one picked up on. And I just want to show you that now. So on this slide at the bottom, there was something that I didn't read. Uh, and I'll read it now. It has nothing to do with temperature of the room that it's sitting in. And actually, what we were doing is we were heating and cooling monoatomic system. And the monoatomic system was giving up energy. And so we set up to do differential thermal analysis. And we found out there was a lot more heat coming out than we were putting in when we heated it. Let me say that again. We found out that there was a lot more heat coming out than we were putting in when we heated it. Wow. Is this a negative resistor? Is this a system, a mode of matter that is able to extract energy from the vacuum, potentially, and uh, pull it in with some level of excitement. Now, what kind of levels of excitement uh, would you need? Well, in the testimony that David Hudson gave, and the link is there on this slide, he says all of these materials need between 200 and 300 degrees centigrade before they will flux flow. And actually later on in his testimony, he says some of them need up to 400 degrees. Flux flow, he's saying, is basically when they're acting in the way that a superconductor behaves. And this is when he is getting this a lot more heat coming out than they were putting in. Additionally, he says that uh, gold needs to be in the uh, AU minus state as all ride. Uh, otherwise, it has a, uh, a lack of an electron and it will try and combine with anything around it. Very reactive, a bit like a alkaline metal. And the last point he says is that monoatomic gold is the only one that will superconduct at room or body temperature. So this is the uh, Easter egg I left in there. And also, uh, if you go and follow the link, there's lots of interesting things to think about uh, in what David Hudson says. A lot of it might seem a little bit esoteric or a little bit uh, 
referential to ancient texts, um, but he did spend, I think it was 12 years, funded by an Asian uh, group uh, and studied uh, this material extremely thoroughly. But I think the findings that uh, we've had and I've observed over the year, uh, this seeming propensity for the production of atoms that act as a superconductor uh, being produced, uh, the uh, information that I was told about negative resistance type devices over the last um, sort of eight years or so, and the information that I was told about um, superconductors uh, encouraging non-superconducting material to start behaving a little bit like a superconductor, and the sort of voltage coming out of Chalani wires when heated, this kind of all fits in uh, with this uh, understanding that David is trying to get across here. So, perhaps excess heat in a Lena system comes from some type of monoatomic structure or superconducting structure that is in the material. And, you know, that's something I just want you to think about. Anyway, and with that, uh, you can watch the um, last comment I have to make, uh, uh, which was actually made on the day. And Tom Clater, who was the person that received the Preparata Medal for proving that Lena produces tritium, um, he also says that in their current work, they are also observing the same kind of uh, element production that uh, I presented was found uh, in the work of Suhas Ralkar. So to me, it was a surprise to him, and he came over and expressed his surprise. Um, and to me, that was confirmation that what Suhas Ralkar had achieved in his fuel preparation was actually real. So I'm going to play those two reels and that will close out this video. Thank you very much for your attention. If anyone wanted to know what this is up here for, yeah, uh, these are the two products that you can easily access that has the highest concentration of monoatomics in. Carrots has the high concentration of iridium and my father always used to say, eat carrots son, it'll make, allow you to see in the dark and he didn't mean vision. <laughs> I don't know. Green talk, you know. <laughs> Thanks. We're all seeing the same stuff. Uh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, really. Yeah. In, in what respect? The... Uh, we're doing the capitation. Okay. Yeah. And we see uh, various elements come up. So, you know, I think... The lead is the most striking thing. Yeah, the lead. But, you know, that's PZT. Mm. But those transducers are on the end of the board, yeah. not the, you know, the front end. No, no, no. You know, so I don't, I don't know if he picked up some contamination or something that way. You know, you have to have he, he, I've, I've questioned him and, yeah. and, and yeah. so on. So yeah. I'm, I'm waiting to see when the, he sent me some more free fuel and it's been through the full cycle. Yeah. So the part fuel I had there had not been through the ultrasonic sieve. So you were literally seeing the stuff yeah. that hadn't, and it hadn't even gone through one other process. It's just car carbon, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, titanium, uh, nickel, and H2O. Yeah. And, and the, the, the steel is three, stainless steel 304. Yeah. So we'll have to uh, keep in touch on this. Yeah, and I'm happy to send you a sample so you can see what's what. I, I'll have the full process sure, field. I'm sure the same. Yeah, we'll see the same and I, he sent me also the ash, having run in the reactor for about six to nine hours for a whole week, like each day. Yeah. 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 Great. No worries. Hey Thanks, Tom. Good yeah. job. Good you. You make it happen, man. <laughs>